Hello there, welcome back and welcome to part two in my Mauritania 1 to 350 scale model build. Now, for those of you hoping for lots of modelling today, I'm afraid you are going to be a bit disappointed. I haven't yet started modelling the kit. Uh, and the reason for that is I am still amassing resources. So um, in today's video, I'm going to go over some of the re resources that I've got. I'm going to talk about some of the resources that I'm still trying to get a hold of. And then I'm also going to talk about my plan for the lighting of this model in more sort of practical terms. And I'm also going to show you all the detailed upsets that I have currently got. So to start with, uh, I'm just going to show you some of the books. Um, this is a book I've had for many years about Mauritania. Mauritania, Pride of the Tyne. Um, and this is a book that sort of talks about her history uh, and her career. Uh, and there's some pretty useful photos in here. But as I say, I've had this for quite a long time and it's quite a thin book. So uh, it's not a huge amount of detail. Uh, and I've recently just bought this book as well, The Unseen Mauritania. And my, my rationale behind buying this is that there are photos galore within it. So hopefully these two books combined will give me a really good amount of sort of first-hand evidence of what Mauritania looked like uh, and chiefly the differences between Mauritania and Lusitania that I'm going to need to be aware of on this model. So those are the books. The other major modelling resource that I want to get um, are some photographs of a large model of Mauritania which is uh, in a museum in Newcastle. Uh, now, I'm planning to go to Newcastle in a couple of weeks' time, so when I do that, I will go to the museum, take as many photos as I possibly can, and they will also act as a really good resource. But I really don't want to start on this kit until I have these resources at my disposal, because, of course, you never want to make a mistake on a model kit. Um, but making a mistake on a model kit that hasn't been in production since the 1980s feels particularly damaging. So um, I want to try to do my absolute best to avoid unforced errors as and when I can. So I will now talk over the lighting system for the model and then I'll finish off the video by showing you some of the detail add-on kits that I've bought. So without any further ado, let's crack on. Here is the hull, bow, all the way to stern. Uh, and I haven't uh, glued this together or anything yet, it's just held together with a hearty piece of masking tape. But it gives us a nice idea of what we're going to do. Uh, and on this model, as I said in my previous video, just like my model Titanic, I am going to do some lighting on this. But I'm going to revise the theory. Um, for the, And the reason is, I think what I did on Titanic worked very well. Um, but this model is significantly smaller. Um, as you can see from comparison, there's Mauritania on top of the glass case, and there's Titanic in the case. And there is a significant difference in scale. As you can see, significantly smaller. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a box, and I've just bought this. This is a black plastic box, nice and simple. Uh, and this is going to sit in the hull, like so. And this is going to have all of the LEDs I need to light the ship. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this stuff, fibre optic cable. And we'll drill holes for this fibre optic cable into the black box. And these will go all over the model. So everywhere, every porthole, every light, every deck light that needs a light source coming out of it is going to have a fibre optic cable going from this black box to where it needs to shine. So if we're looking at this portal here, that's going to have fibre optic cable going into here. Now what this does, and the reason behind this, is that light bleed is going to be a much bigger issue on a ship this size than on Titanic. Titanic was such a big model that there was lots of space to um, uh, to, to sort of fit light bleeding measures and things like that. Uh, on this model, there's really not very much space. So the more I can do to contain the light at source and just distribute it where I want, the better. So that is why I'm going to use this box. Nice and easy. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is as follows. So as you can see, this box opens 
comes apart and it can screw together but it also actually just clips together quite nicely. Now one of the things I really dislike when I see models is I really don't like things that can't be maintained later. I really I hate the idea of putting electronics inside a model and then gluing it all shut because then it's very very difficult to gain access if something goes wrong in the future and let's be realistic here something probably will go wrong at some point in the future it could be a year but it could also be 10 years but at some point something's going to go wrong and it'll be annoying so what i propose to do is to have this box removable from the model so what i'm planning on doing is cutting this shape out of the bottom of the hull so that when you need you can simply lift the model up off its stand and from underneath you can pull out all of the LEDs all of the wiring whilst of course leaving this top section which has all of the fibre optics in it and that way you can gain access to anything that conceivably could break within the ship if necessary repair it if necessary just change a fuse if necessary, just resolder a joint, whatever it is. But the point is that the ship is then really maintainable. It's very, very tricky for this to break in such a way that you can't fix it. Right, just some demonstrations of this box and its light holding capabilities. What I've got here is I've got a reel of LEDs. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop these into this box okay now we're going to have to leave a hole because i'm not going to cut these leds at this point but what i'll emphasize is that no light is going to escape around the sides okay and just to show you the whole setup over here i've got my power supply which we can just turn on and as you can see that's giving us five volts which is giving us really nice light source directly from our leds so there you go what wonderful camera work, eh? So we've got the LEDs, and what I'll do is I'll just let out a little reel of them. Put them together like this. And then bang them into the box. And as you can see, no light bleed at all from any side of the box. Obviously light escapes from the bottom because that's where I push the LEDs in, but um, no light bleed at all from the sides. So that's great. Um, and of course, when I drill the multiple holes for all these fibre optics, and there will be probably hundreds by the end, um, the, the beauty of fibre optics, I'll try and see if I can show you it. The beauty of fibre optics is that the light only really goes out the end of the fibre. So I'll cut a piece off here. I'll just demonstrate it. Here we have a piece of fibre. And I'll just hold one end over the LED. And you can see that the fibre itself only really glows at the point. If I move it off the LED, that goes away again, back on the LED and so on. So this is a really nice, elegant way of transferring light all over the model whilst controlling it quite nicely. Now, obviously, this is not my original idea, anything like that. Loads and loads of modelers have done this before. Um, and the person who gave me the idea for this sort of box with fibres coming off was John Hollis. So thank you, John. Um, but I think it's probably quite a, a commonly used practice turn off the power supply. Uh, I think it's quite a commonly used practice, largely because it works. Um, so that's the plan. Now, a few words on portholes. Right, a few words on portholes. Uh, what I've done here is I've just written down the size of some fairly common portholes for liners of the era, uh, and then I've converted that into metric in millimetres, uh, and then I've converted it down to what that would be in 1 to 350 scale, which is what the scale of this model is. So a 24 inch porthole, which would be 609 millimetres, so 61 centimetres, give or take, uh, that would boil down to 1.7 millimetres at the scale of my model. Uh, a 12 inch porthole, which is 304.8, so 305 millimetres, 
um, that would be 30.5 centimetres, and at model scale, 0.87 millimetres. Now, the take-home message I want you to get from this is that 10, 12, 14 are all within 0.2 of a millimetre of each other, and 16 up to 24, which is a considerable difference, is only 0.6 of a millimetre from each other. Now, 0.6 of a millimetre is thinner than that. Now, the reason I'm talking about this is because on my Titanic model, I was quite studious about drilling the portholes the correct size to get them historically accurate. And I think that was quite important on a model of that scale because it would have been quite obvious if they were wrong. This model is much smaller. This is my hand next to it. And for comparison, for something a bit more calibrated, let's say, even though obviously you don't calibrate a ruler, that's a ruler. They go millimetres. So that is 10 centimetres there. And for the American friends amongst us, that's four inches. So that's the size of this model. So it's significantly smaller. What, what, what I'm boiling down to saying here is that I am going to drill two porthole sizes only on this model. Um, I'm going to drill what I'm calling small porthole, so that's these lower decks and the front sections, and then I'm going to drill larger portholes, which are these ones on the higher up decks. Now there's two reasons for that. Firstly, I think realistically the drilling errors I would get from using these drill bit sizes which, by the way, you can't get. But the drilling errors I'd get just by me using my hands to drill would probably be sig more significant than the size difference in these holes anyway. Um, the other reason, though, is that, remember, these holes need to have a fibre optic cable backing them up. And this is only available in certain thicknesses, certain diameters. So what I've done is I've defined a small porthole as one millimetre. So we're talking closest real life size would be a 14 inch porthole here, and a large porthole 1.4, which equates to a 19 and 3 quarter inch porthole. So I'm actually waiting on getting some Mauritania plans posted to me. Um, and this might be subject to change as a result of those, but this is the sort of idea I'm going for. I'm going to have to find two different sizes of porthole because there was genuine size difference between the higher up decks and the lower decks. And I do want to make it as accurate as possible. But I am going to have to bow to what manufacturers uh, produce in ways of fibre optics. And of course, I'm also going to have to work within what commercial drill sizes are available. And those are just things I really can't do anything about. So there you go. So I've now bought myself three different sizes of fibre optic cable. Apologies for the cluttered desk. Some people will say a cluttered desk is a cluttered mind, but my answer to that would be, what's an empty desk? So, three sizes. Um, predictably, I was not able to find a 1.4 millimetre fibre optic cable, which would have been for my large porthole. What I have found is a 1.5 millimetre. So the sizes I've got here are, this is the small size, and this is a one, excuse me, this is a 0.9 mil. That's 0.9 mil, that's for the small, port, small portals. Really need to get some digital calipers, but I can't be bothered paying the price for them. Then we have this, which is a 1.5, although actually, it measures a little bit more like 1.4, but it is. it was sold as 1.5. So that's for the large portals. And then I've also bought this really beefy stuff here. Um, this is really thick. This is... Two and a half mil. Uh, and I bought this for the uh, the windows and stuff up in the superstructure which are still going to need lighting. Um, but these are, you know, these are going to be, they're not portholes anymore at that point. They are full on windows. Uh, so three sizes. Um, obviously, as this gets bigger, it becomes less flexible. There's really a sort of minimum bend radius that you want to have with these things. So you have to be a little bit more clever as you go up the sizes on how you restrain these, because obviously 
if it's leading from a light box to a light to a window and I'm bending it like that, over time the glue is going to fail and it'll spring back. So I might need to look at things like heating and bending this to make to sort of reduce strain as much as possible. But none of these issues are insurmountable. And I've also bought lots of add-ons. So I bought quite a lot of stuff from Tom's Model Works. Um, and the reason why I bought so much is because they have a sort of a full set of Titanic photo etch in 1 to 350 scale, which is, of course, my model's scale. Um, and it was cheaper to buy the entire set, which comes with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 pieces of photo etch. It was cheaper to buy the entire set than it was to buy the individual parts that I need. For example, I don't really need the Titanic davits because... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, Mauritania didn't use well and style davits, it used different style davits. However, there may well be some useful stuff. These, the grab lines on the boats and things may well prove to be useful later. Oars and things might be quite useful, so it may well not be wasted. Um, deck chairs and stuff, um, these will add nice little bit of interest to the decks of the model when we come to that point. Of course, lots of railings, and uh, I need plenty of railings for this model because apart from anything else, the original casting on this kit actually has quite a lot of the railings cast into the plastic. And they're, of course, all going to be cut off and replaced with actual railings. Um, so plenty of railings required. Um, a compass platform that I suspect I won't use because that was very specific to the Olympic class liners. Um, Various bits of detail here, grates, vents, cranes, ladders. I'm sure things that I'll probably find some form of use for at some point. Uh, some lovely benches. Once again, I'm sure I will find a use for these. Benches were all over the shop on these ships, so well worth having those. And lastly, some windows. Now, again, these are windows which are designed for a model of Titanic. However, I am fairly confident that with a bit of tweaking with a craft knife, I will be able to get some of these windows built into an appropriate shape for the Mauritania. And these will just sort of pick out small bits of detail on the model, which are well worth having, I think. Uh, other photo etch that I've managed to get, I've got some 1 to 350 scale boat ladders and ramps and things, uh, and also some stairs. These will be very useful, again, for some added detail on the model as we go. And then another generic set here of railings. Um, so plenty of stuff to help sort of supplement the detail on the kit. The other piece that I've got is this. And again, this is designed once again for a Titanic model, but I'm fairly confident I will be able to sort of change it for Mauritania. This is a brass mast set. So you've got two masts in there which are brass. And the advantage of this particularly at this scale, is any plastic mast I use will be very flimsy and very bendy. Uh, and if I suspend a Marconi array from a mast, which is very bendy, it's going to bend and it's not going to look very realistic. Brass at this scale is pretty robust and pretty stiff, uh, so that should hopefully add some really good quality detail onto the model. It does beg the question how on earth I'm going to do the Marconi array, um, but that's, that's a problem perhaps for another day. The only other piece of detail that I really need to get my hands on is a wooden deck. Now, a wooden deck does exist for this model. Um, it's just only available in America, so how I actually get my hands on that, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Probably some groveling emails or something. But anyway, for now, those are the detail up kits that I'll be using. So there you go. That is the lay of the land. That's how we are going to start progressing. Um, next video will probably be in a couple of weeks once I've had a chance to look at this model, take some photos up in Newcastle. Um, so I'm not going to create another video now until I've actually started modelling because uh, it's, you know, it's not very interesting for you. I think I've covered all of the sort of pre-modelling stuff I wanted to cover anyway. So um, a new video is not going to come out until I actually start cutting portholes, cutting away bits of plastic that I don't want, that kind of thing. So probably two, three weeks until the next one. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Uh, if you have, like, subscribe, usual YouTube rubbish, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.